The Outer Banks are beautiful. Things you can see and do here you can't do anywhere else on the East Coast. Hatteras Island and its iconic lighthouse are the heart of the Outer Banks. It's nice to be out in a sandbar in the middle of the Atlantic, you know, it's, you're, you're, we're out here. The Bonner Bridge connects visitors to the island and island residents to the rest of the world. I think it's the difference between life and death. It helps fuel a tourism economy worth hundreds of millions of dollars. This is our lifeline. But the bridge is well past its lifespan and showing its age. Man, I can peel off a chunk of concrete here that's four inches. A fight between the state and environmentalists over replacing the bridge is in court. They're destroying lives and of people that work here and it's just, a, it's just a real mess. So was the state closing the bridge in December. Worst case scenario is that the bridge would, would suffer some sort of uh, catastrophic collapse. The state blamed the environmentalists. These ivory tower elitists uh, file these lawsuits from their air-conditioned offices. The environmentalists called that political noise. Island residents fired back too. Well, it's a crap is what it is. In a fight so ugly, it's left some afraid to speak out publicly. Because I'm worried for my family. Meantime, the bridge remains in a near constant state of repair. They're just putting bigger and bigger band-aids on it. The Bonner Bridge is in troubled water, both literally and figuratively. The pilings that support it are in turbulent currents and shifting sands. The battle over its replacement is turbulent too, drenched in political partisanship that pits state leaders against leading environmentalists and neighbor against neighbor. But no matter which side of the divide those folks stand on, they all want that old bridge replaced, and soon. Few people appreciate the importance of the Bonner Bridge more than Joe Klee. I think it's the difference between life and death. Klee has a rare form of leukemia he needs to cross the bridge two to three times a week for regular medical care. Looks like your transfusion requirements have somewhat improved. Sometimes the trip is to get his blood numbers checked. If they're not adequate, then I need transfusions, and that necessitates having to go up the next day. He also goes for monthly chemo. Which is supposed to buy me some uh, additional time. December's bridge closure delayed his treatment. He worries about it happening again. I mean, if I don't get the treatment, then I guess my numbers will continue to deteriorate. It's a price you pay. For living on an island and depending on a bridge, but there are rewards too. I'm drawn to the water and so is my wife, and it's kind of what makes life worth living. They moved here from Washington, D.C. in 1987. We fell in love with it and uh, decided to make it our home. You're exposed to nature and it's all around you and you're not crowded. Those are some of the same things that drew Jim Lyons here. Hatters was the only place I ever wanted to live other than where I grew up from a very young age. It was just, you know, a beautiful, wild, coastal place. Still is in a lot of ways. Lyons has lived here for 40 years. He understands the importance of the Bonner Bridge. I think it would be really much more restrictive if there wasn't some kind of bridge. There wasn't a bridge when Lyons vacationed here as a child, so his family took a ferry. Once you don't have to carry water from the well anymore, you don't want to go back to the water again. And um, the bridge is kind of like that. We've all come to depend on it. And they're not the only ones. Hatters is a really important place to not just the people that live here, but everybody in the United States. Those people mean business to Matt Nuzzo. He's co-founder of Real Water Sports in Waves. I mean, we book people from all over the world that come here uh, to take kiteboarding and surfing lessons with us. It's the perfect spot with surfing on the ocean side and kiteboarding on the sound side. Nuzzo says it's perfect for his family too. You just have great access to the outdoors and that's, you know, that's what we love to do. And, um, you know, it's safe, uh, it's safe for our kids. It's, uh, it's safe for us and, and uh, it's just nice. It's
His wife Lucy crosses the Bonner Bridge five days a week to take their kids to school in Kitty Hawk. Anywhere you go, it's a long trip. She was making that trip in December, bringing the kids home from school, when the bridge closure stranded her on the mainland. Now we are stuck. <laughs> what was also stressful was that the next day the ferry was co were completely full, you know, for, with everybody trying to go back home. She didn't make it home for four days. Luckily we had friends up there she stayed with. Now on those trips, she packs extra food and clothes. Because hey. I don't know you know, when it's gonna happen next. And she worries what she'd do at a medical emergency if the bridge were closed and the ferries weren't running. We can't afford not to have access to the mainland. You know, it's just it's very scary to me. The closure cost Real Water Sports some Christmas shoppers. Had it happened in summer, Nuzzo says he would have lost 90% of his business. Not having 50,000 people a week turn over. You know, our business is based on tourism. More than two million tourists visited the Cape Hatteras National Seashore last year. Ralph Mooney and Amy Drum drove all the way from Bristol, Tennessee in February to beat the crowds. This is actually a great opportunity just to be able to come down here and relax and look around. They'll spend money on lodging, attractions, and souvenirs. Hopefully find a nice seafood restaurant. Tourism in Dare County generates nearly a billion dollars a year in revenue, producing about $85 million in state and local taxes. Annual tourism expenditures on Hatteras Island alone are more than $200 million, generating nearly $20 million in state and local taxes. You can make a very strong business argument for the return on investment that highway access to Hatteras Island offers to not only that local economy, to, but to the state. Lane, who did the economic impact study of Hatteras Island, also calculated the value of the island's brand at $100 million. The brand includes iconic images like the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, an image that drew Amy Drum here. It's beautiful. I mean, you know, just even looking at it online, you can just tell how beautiful it is. And then seeing it up close and personal is even more breathtaking. But these images can tarnish the brand that attracts so many tourists. Once a bridge or once a road is inaccessible on the internet, there's always a question in the minds of potential visitors as to whether it is still accessible. That can cause those visitors to change their vacation plans. And that's a threat to Matt Nuzzo's business. They should have had a solution for this stuff 20 years ago. Next, the increasingly contentious debate over a solution. I'm not so grateful about the stupidity of what these environmental nuts have been doing to us down here. All right, hold on. It's been two months since the Bonner Bridge reopened and the North Carolina Department of Transportation is doing another routine sonar scan of the bridge pilings and the sand around them. These weekly sonars are showing that, that that material is staying in place. The material is sand pumped in by dredge to shore up bridge pilings right after the closure. The DOT is also stacking concrete modules and sandbags around the pilings. The difference we've seen has been a good difference. We're trying to identify any scour issues. That wasn't the case last April when scans showed something else around a section of the bridge called Bent 166. We could see that there's a little bit of a scour hole developing here. Scouring occurs when currents wash sand away from bridge pilings. In October, the scour hole at Bent 166 was larger. And also kind of drifting around as far as its footprint. By mid-November, the hole was even larger and much deeper. More and more piling is being exposed. The DOT requested bids from contractors to shore up the pilings. But on November the 29th, before a bid could be awarded, Scan showed pilings even more exposed. You essentially get beyond that comfort zone. We closed this bridge uh, to traffic because it posed an immediate safety concern. Had a bridge uh, knocked out. Uh, it was the first time DOT closed the Bonner Bridge since a dredge slammed into it in 1990. Since then, the state has spent more than $56 million in repairs and maintenance. This is ongoing work to replace steel supports that were installed in the 1970s. It's always a battle and it's always a challenge. 
The bridge was supposed to have been replaced in 1993. The DOT spent more than a decade studying replacement alternatives. In 2003, it and a dozen other state and federal agencies involved in the project agreed to a 17-mile bridge that was to pass to the west of Oregon Inlet out into Pamlico Sound around Pea Island Wildlife Refuge to Redanthe. When all the agencies agreed on the longer bridge in 2003, the plan was to begin construction in 2006, and the bridge would have been completed in 2010. But Dare County politicians instead pushed for a shorter, cheaper bridge parallel to the old one. They're the ones that stood up and said, we want it just like it is. We want status quo. In that time, then Senator Mark Bassnight led the effort. This is a question of economy and also access to the Island National Wildlife Refuge for the people of this country. The DOT delayed the project for more study. It ultimately decided to go with the shorter, parallel bridge and awarded a contract for the work in July of 2011. The contractor's bid, we let the contract and he's ready to go. But the Southern Environmental Law Center filed a lawsuit on behalf of two environmental groups to stop the project. The parallel bridge will not provide access in a safe and dependable and long-term way. A judge sided with the state, but the SELC appealed. A ruling is pending. The fact that uh, the SELC is delaying uh, the construction of new, new bridge is threatening every single day the people who drive over that bridge and they fail to see that. The December bridge closure inflamed the debate. These ivory tower elitists you know, file these lawsuits from their air-conditioned offices in <coughs> Chapel Hill or Charlottesville or wherever and uh, they, they uh, do so uh, with uh, you know their lattes and contempt. We just view that largely as as political noise. It's unfortunate. Uh, it's it's not the way you know we engage in this type of discussion. Some question whether the closure was politically motivated to put pressure on the SELC to drop its lawsuit. After all, DOT scans of the pilings on December the third, the day the agency closed the bridge show they were no worse off than on November the 29th when the DOT declared the bridge safe for travel. I take exception, extreme exception to that. This equipment helped us make those decisions very fast. DOT engineers say they recommended closing the bridge after taking more time to analyze the earlier data. We started talking about not uh, if to close, but when to close, and I asked my engineers a question. School bus full of your children on this bridge right now, are you comfortable, they said, close the bridge. The closure infuriated most of the island's 4,300 residents who had to wait in line for the longer trip on emergency ferries. Many were still seething over a contentious battle with the National Park Service over beach driving restrictions. They should have replaced it years ago and told the environmentalists and turtle people and bird people like we're gonna build it to hell with y'all. The debate has gotten so hot that some locals are afraid to speak publicly in favor of the longer bridge. I'm positive that there would be forces that would seek me out and my family would be jeopardized. My property would be jeopardized just because I've seen it happen before. Some Long Bridge supporters question putting a new bridge in the same challenging location. Well, I don't think that you ought to put a bridge right smack in the middle of the highest energy part of a system. But engineers say the new parallel bridge will be built with better materials and deeper pilings than the old one. It'll cost $216 million. The DOT says the cost of the longer bridge would be around a billion dollars. Frankly, we believe that they're making that number up. That's because the DOT estimated the cost of the Long Bridge at only $569 million just two years ago. How did that go to nearly a billion dollars in such a short amount of time? So that, I think that was sort of a, a rogue estimate that was based upon improper materials. Tata says three engineering firms all estimated the cost of the Long Bridge at around a billion dollars. But the DOT doesn't know how much more it will have to spend along Highway 12 south to Redanthe after it builds the parallel bridge. Fixing the Bonner Bridge part of the access route 
is going to be insufficient when so much of the rest of the road on Highway 12 is at risk. DOT is already getting ready to spend another $80 million to replace this temporary bridge with a permanent one where Hurricane Irene formed a new inlet in 2011. There are a couple of miles of NC-12 that are challenging and we're addressing those challenges in, in separate uh, bids. But the SCLC says that violates a federal law that requires new bridges through the wildlife refuge to be treated as one complete project, not separate ones. And the agencies considered it a complete project from its beginning uh, in 1993. 20 years ago. Right now, the parallel bridge, the additional bridges to the south, and associated beach nourishment to protect Highway 12 would cost an estimated $451 million. Which is approaching the low estimate from DOT of $569 million for the entire final solution to the problem with the longer bridge. The DOT also can't predict how many new inlets might form south of the new parallel bridge. I wish I knew. I wish I knew it would make my job a lot easier. And easier for the DOT to predict how much more it will spend to preserve continued access to Hatteras Island after building the new parallel bridge. Other challenges to that section of Highway 12 include the narrowing of the island. Scientists say it's been exacerbated by DOT's blocking of the natural inlet formation, an overwash that helped the island build width. There is also the island's gradual westward migration. The lighthouse is moving. Can you see? Yeah. That migration forced the movement of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse in 1999. If you just go out there and count the number of houses that are in the surf zone, they didn't build them in the surf zone. Riggs says DOT's new bridges south of Oregon Inlet will soon end up in the surf zone too and eventually in the ocean. And I'm not sure that uh, a structure in the ocean is viable. Its supporters say the 17-mile bridge would avoid all those issues and will be cheaper in the long run. And keep this National Wildlife Refuge from becoming a long-term construction zone. At some point, there's gonna have to be some acknowledgement of how fast things are changing down there. Stan Riggs agrees. As a coastal geologist who studied the dynamics of Hatteras Island for decades, he says policymakers need to let science drive their decisions. We've thrown science under the bus at this point in time, and it will, we will pay a price for that. No question about it. Next, where the Hatteras Island residents we introduced you to earlier stand in the bridge debate. I don't care what happens as long as something happens. To learn more about the Bonner Bridge debate and its history, go to WRL.com and type WRL Doc in the search box. Joe Klee, Jim Lyons, and the Nuzzos all share the same love of Hatteras Island, but not the same view on how to replace the bridge that connects it to the mainland. Klee wants the SCLC to drop its lawsuit so construction of the parallel bridge can begin. Why won't they give up? Why can't we just go on with life? The bridge has been there for 50 years. We need to replace it even if it means building more bridges to the south over new inlets. We're gonna look like the Keys. I'm not a latte drinking guy. <laughs> In fact, Jim Lyons is a hunter and fisherman, but says the short bridge is only a short-term solution. When you're in a sinking ship, you're gonna grab the first float that comes by, and, and that's what I think a lot of people's um, feelings about that short bridge is, you know, this is a plan, we can get it done, we can get something started right now, it's ready to go. But Lyons says the long bridge is better in the long term. I want reliable access to the island, and I want it for not. I want it long past when I'm when I'm not here. So do Matt and Lucy Nuzzo. Matt's business has been interrupted far more often by closures of Highway 12 and the wildlife refuge than closures of the Bonner Bridge. The constant presence of DOT earth moving equipment is a daily reminder that it can happen again at any time. They're there every day working on that road. 
The Nuzzos understand that the 17-mile bridge would put an end to that. But for them, what many call a bridge too far is a bridge too late. I do think that the long bridge is probably the way to go, but again, that's not the fa fastest. And for me, the safest and fastest for right now is the best. The fastest solution is going to be the best solution. The fastest solution is the DOT's parallel bridge plan. They just need to get on with it and get it done. Which will no doubt make a lot of Hatteras Island residents and business owners happy. The only problem is that new bridge will connect it to a highway that's future is as uncertain as the shifting sands beneath it.